fast, cheap, and out of control, a robot invasion of the solar system was a rather influential paper by Rodney Brooks when he was the director of MIT's AI lab back in the 80s. And as well as describing a pioneering approach to robotics in the 1980s and a way to explore space, fast, cheap, and out of control is a relevant description that can be applied to the startup ecosystem today. The changing funding landscapes converging with technological developments in a way that allows robotics to be a really interesting area to be involved with these days. And maybe hardware is not so hard anymore. What are the implications for entrepreneurs, for investors, and for society? So it's my pleasure to have a fantastic panel of five wonderful roboticists who have pioneering robot startups and are willing to share their experience with us. Rodney Brooks, who's the pioneering robotics researcher, founder of iRobot, and now the founder of Rethink Robotics, who make Baxter. Steve Cousins, the founder of Savvy Oak and ex-CEO of Willow Garage, which may just have started more robot companies than even Rodney. And Nolan Caddis, the business development manager at AnyBots, the robot company founded by Y Combinator's Trevor Blackwell in 2001. And you can see AnyBot downstairs in the main foyer. And finally, from Vienna, University of Technology, and not from Silicon Valley, we have Walter Walkinger and Michael Zilich from Blue Danube Robotics, who are ready to demo their robot head outside in the um, area between the academy stage and the speaker lounge. And uh, that's a pretty amazing demonstration. But first, I'm going to ask each of the panelists to describe some of their contributions to robotics. And um, Rodney, would you like to lead off? And can we roll first the video Meet Baxter? I uh, started out uh, making robot companies a long time ago. And if we could have the, uh, I think we've got an image from uh, uh, Vienna Airport. Uh, maybe we can put that up. Um, I was building, uh, th this greeted me when I got off the plane on Monday in Vienna Airport. iRobot was a company that I started. And we we're manufacturing Roombas in China. Over 10 million of them have been sold already. And I realized that manufacturing was not sustainable in low-cost wage areas because the wages are going up in China. So I wanted to make manufacturing more possible in the United States and in Europe. So we built the robot Baxter with three main ideas. One, that it should be very cheap. 
two, that I should be safe to interact with as close as I am to Andrew here, and three, that an ordinary factory worker should be able to program it. And if we could roll the, the uh, uh, making coffee video without sound while I talk, the, you'll see that a, a complex task here that was programmed by a person who's never written a line of code in their life in an hour to get, in, in one hour they're able to get back to so make coffee. So to me, it's important that for robot startups, for robot companies, that they do something useful for an end user. In this case, the end user is in factories, um, providing automation tools that ordinary factory workers can use. Um, additionally, we base this on Willow Garage's um, uh, ROS robot operating system, and this has been a great service to the community. I think you guys are using ROS also. So now there's a common um, software platform across the, across the world that people are using for their robot companies, and we can build on top of that and share modules back and forth. So we've also uh, got a version of, of uh, Baxter, which we're now selling not only in the US, but also in Europe, as a research uh, robot, a platform with two arms, low cost, so that we're hoping hundreds of people will start coming up with new applications for safe robot arms. And with that, I think we'll eventually see a lot of new companies spin out to do new sorts of things that no one thought possible before. It's important to have thousands of researchers working on any new technology before it really takes off. We saw that with mobile robots in the, in the 90s, which led to SLAM, simultaneous localization and mapping, which has left, let, let, led to the Google self-driving car and all the other car companies having self-driving cars. So we're hoping that by having low cost and safe robot arms out there, people will be able to do things besides make coffee with the robot, but interesting things for all sorts of new applications. And with that, I'd like to pass it back to Andra. Perhaps um, after that talk about Ross, Steve, could you tell us something about Willow Garage? Sure. So Willow Garage was started about uh, six and a half years ago. And the interesting thing about it was it was a pretty unusual company. Uh, the founder, Scott Hassan, said, um, I've got funding for 60 people, 6-0, six uh, indefinitely, um, and I've got this building. What should we do? And I said, nothing. I, 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 don't, know what we want. I don't know what you want to do with the money. And uh, he, I, he said, I said, come back to me when you have a little bit more idea. And so he came back and said, I got excited about autonomous cars. I'm excited about autonomous technology. And I said, OK, that's enough. We can, we can take that as a go. So we gave ourselves uh, a project, which was to build uh, 10 robots and give them away to universities. And the problem back in 2007 was that universities didn't, they all used different robots. And they all used different software. And nothing was being shared. And so the field was kind of moving slowly. What we did. Um, we, we eventually built, decided to build 20 robots instead of 10 and build this software to go with them called ROS. In, in the end, we we're, were really bad at keeping our plan straight. So instead of giving away 10 and keeping 10, we gave away 11 because we couldn't decide. But um, in the end, a bunch of robots around, universities around the world got these great robots, the PR2, and the software, the first generation that went with it. One of the, the secrets was that we kept having interns coming into Willow and we treated the software, the open source software, like a disease vector uh, in the sense that students would come, they would learn this system, they would go back and infect their labs. And so Ross has taken off worldwide in academic research labs and now in industrial research labs as well. And, and I'm very excited about that. So let me show you uh, a little video about, uh, if we can cue the, the Ross third birthday. This is a video that came out um, in 2010. So about six months after the PR2 shipped. And these are all different robots that we're using ROS. This is the PR2 uh, playing with or without you. That was a weekend project by some student at the University of Pennsylvania. And the, all the rest of the robots that you see are robots running the same software. And this was really revolutionary um, in, in robotics. Uh, here you see some of the mapping software that was built in. And uh, navigation was one of the things that we did well. We actually had the PR2 robot navigate uh, 140 kilometers over two weeks of continuous operation, plugging itself in as needed. There's some interesting robots. This is a quad rotor building a 3D map of a room. This is at the University of Pennsylvania. Quad rotors doing some really cool tricks um, running ROS. Um, 
And yes, it really did go through. Um, this is uh, grasping, which is a surprisingly difficult task for robots. It's so easy for us. Object recognition is something that we worked on. Um, and so combination of recognition and grasping. And Ross took off exponentially uh, beyond our wildest dreams. Along the way, we spun out. Uh, we created a telepresence robot. Uh, this is a robot from France. And you see just an enormous number of robots using this software. It basically brought a community together and let people stand on one another's shoulders in order to do things that hadn't been done before. Um, so in, in the end, once uh, Ross was out and the PR2 was out, we started looking at what should we do next. And one of the, the difficult things when you have a bunch of smart people together is that uh, there's a lot of good ideas. And so what we did instead is we took one, first one of those ideas, which was this remote presence robot, uh, which is similar to the one uh, that we're going to hear about from AnyBots. And the ro remote presence robot spun out as a company called Suitable Technologies. That was our first spin-off. Over the next uh, two and a half years, we spun off seven more companies, three of them nonprofits and uh, four of them for-profit, so a total of five for-profit companies. Um, and those companies have done really well. They've, uh, um, the Suitable is, has a nice product that's out today selling. Two of the companies um, have been funded externally. So they, the typical model was that the, the founder, Will Garage, would fund the beginning of the startups. And then over time, they would take additional funding. Um, one of the companies is a consulting company that's uh, doubled in size, hasn't taken uh, external capital, but basically just running, uh, uh, kind of growing organically. Um, and another robot that's 10 times cheaper than the PR2 was just announced last week by Unbounded Robotics. Um, it's in the $35,000 price range instead of the $280,000 price range. And so uh, big changes in robotics. Things are going really fast. Um, the last thing I'll say is uh, about what I'm doing now. I've, so Willow Garage has basically broken off into a bunch of different companies, and, and itself doesn't really exist anymore. Um, I've started a new company called Savvy Oak to continue on some of the core work we were doing at Willow to look at service robotics. Um, one of the surprising things, and um, one of the things I struggle with as a, as a new startup, is that what I really want to do in terms of impact is have robots help people with disabilities. Um, we at Will Garage had a uh, man with, uh, he had a brainstem stroke and basically was quadriplegic and mute. So he's got perfect input, right? He can feel, he can hear, he can see, he can think, but his output is extremely limited. He can't talk and he can't really move his hands. He can just move his head around a little bit and kind of move a mouse on the screen. Um, and what he did was use a PR2 as his external body and use it for really mundane things like reach the hand in front of his face and scratch an itch. But for him, that's enormous. Right? And so what I struggle with as an entrepreneur is that's a uh, huge impact, but that's not um, really a big market. And so how do, we, how do we find the way to be able to help people like that, um, but along the way do it uh, helping enough people that it's actually a real market? So that's kind of where we are. That's a perfect uh, segue over to Nolan Catter from AnyBots. Do you want to explain a little bit about how AnyBots came about and what you're doing? Um, so, as Andrea uh, mentioned, IndieBots was founded by Trevor Blackwell, uh, who was a technologist in 2001, and it was primarily a robotics research company. Uh, he did really well during the dot-com era and just wanted to pursue his passion in robotics. Then in 2009, he leveraged that research and introduced the QB, which is a robot that's located in the corner of the stage here. And uh, it, it kind of looks like... Um, you know, a 1950s version of what a robot should look like. Uh, it's a Jetson meets modern age uh, robotics. So the QB is a two-wheeled self-balancing robot that can be controlled anywhere in the world through a web browser. So for instance, if somebody wanted to be at this uh, conference or the Pioneers Festival and unable to make it, and let's say they're in San Francisco, uh, so long as they have a web browser and we have the QB connected to either Wi-Fi or 4G, uh, in a nanosecond, they're instantly going to be immersed in our environment, moving around, talking, and being here as if they're actually here, experiencing the forefront of a new class of communication that Steve had mentioned called virtual telepresence, or some call it mobile telepresence, uh, which essentially is adding mobility to video conferencing. So anytime that you can see a benefit of uh, having 
a remote environment and where you can have mobility, then this is the ideal type of technology. Uh, and next to being face to face, it's, it's probably one of the most interactive forms of communication that we do have. And some might say, you know, why not a, a Skype session? But uh, the problem with Skype is that you have to be dependent on someone else on the other end to answer that call. And what we have, it's not only remotely controlled, but it's uh, also remotely activated. So you're not dependent on someone to answer the call, and you're not relegated to stay in one particular location. You're very free to roam around. And that freedom can mean a lot uh, of different things to different people, uh, to name a few. It could be a commuter that wants to escape the mental drudgery of sitting in traffic uh, by working from home, myself included. I have about a two and a half hour to six hour commute one way to work. So I prefer to use mobile telepresence whenever I can. Uh, it could be somebody that wants to avoid that 17 hour flight uh, to keep an eye on quality control for manufacturing. Or it could be a CEO of an up and coming startup that uh, wants to stay engaged with newly dispersed offices. It could be a family member that wants to attend an important event that uh, is unable to do so for one reason or another and now can do it from anywhere in the world. Um, and it could be a child that doesn't want to miss out on a, a life experience. And, and to showcase that example, I'd uh, like to roll the video My Weekend. On Saturday, I said good morning to my mom. I played with my dog in the backyard. He's such a great dog. On Sunday, I got to play with my friends. I guess I did do a lot this weekend. It was fun to see my friends and family. My doctor said that I wouldn't be able to leave my room, but then they got me a new robot called AnyBots. It can go anywhere and be me. It's so cool. I can't wait to go to school and tell my teacher what I did. Amazing, right? And, and that has to be my favorite use case for this type of technology. You know, we're uh, providing a platform that enables children that are going through these isolated medical treatments to still feel connected to the world. So, you know, they, um, they don't have to feel isolated, and I, and I feel this is a big proponent in their healing process. In this case, that was Grady Hoffman, who was a nine year old going through bone marrow treatment, uh, and he was able to use a robot to bot in when he was feeling lonely if he wanted to see mom or play with his dog in the backyard, as I mentioned in that video clip. And he had a, a little brother that liked to be read to each night to go to bed, and he could do so. Uh, he attended birthday parties. He went to school and was also able to go out to recess. And, and that in itself is very powerful. And in fact, uh, there's an inspiring segment that was produced by BBC called Boy Lives as a Robot for Two Months. And I encourage you all to watch that if you haven't already. Um, so. That, the QB is, uh, I love it. It's very exciting. It's incredible technology. But over the course of the past few years, we've attended quite a few events. And people love it. It's fun. It's exciting to tip. It's fresh. But we haven't sold very many of them. So the question is, what does it take to get growth to happen, not just for any bots, but for telepresence in general, like Beam? And uh, that's, that's a little bit what I want to talk about. And I think there's a few things that it, it really is going to take to be a catalyst for growth. Um, one of them being the technology, you know, creating a user experience that, uh, that the user will continue to use this technology and want to use it over and over again. Uh, second would be market acceptance, which when we first started out, it really wasn't there. But that's luckily changing and changing pretty rapidly. Um, a lot of this is uh, due to media coverage and also from corporate involvement. You know, you have uh, the CEO of Yahoo, Marissa Meyer, who recently made a huge splash uh, requiring all the Yahoos to work in the same place because she realizes that people are more productive when they work alone, but it's the team collaboration that really sparks the innovation. And it's, it's also interesting because she mentions AnyBots in this, in this article to help make this happen. So we do feel we're very well aligned with this growing habit of people that aren't necessarily going into work or just can't go to work. Uh, and to back that up, I recently rented a QB for one month to MBBJ, which is a large global um, architecture firm uh, that conducted a one month study uh, to study telepresence in the workplace. Uh, and this was an enterprise-wide effort that was headed by Naomi, Dr. Naomi Stanford, has a PhD in organizational design and behavior. And the findings were just, they were astounding. 
Uh, one was we know where we need to be. Uh, there were some limitations of having a robot in the workplace. But this very much supported the new direction that we're headed in our new developments. Um, the other thing was it showed that telepresence Spark sees impromptu conversations that generally never happen. There's waterside chats that are, that are very important and also can spark innovation. But what really excites me um, is the fact that now, for the future of architectural design, they're incorporating robots in their planning. So that's, that's a big thing. And then to, to add to that, you know, I, we've got to thank companies like GE who are uh, showing commercials of robots going underneath cars and underneath airplanes and collecting data in, in very meaningful ways. Um, and then you talk about Cisco, who in, mentioned the Internet of Things or the Internet of Everything. Uh, all of a sudden, you grow the scope of what the opportunity can be for any bots incorporating something more than just telepresence. Thank you. Well, I'm from Silicon Valley Robotics, so I'm delighted that there are so many Silicon Valley Robotics companies here. But you did work there for quite a while. In fact, you could almost say everything started there. But doesn't anybody here want to see a Viennese robotics company? Are you curious to know what's happening in Vienna in robotics? <laughs> That's what I thought. Uh, we're here to hear from Walter Walkinger and Michael Zilich from Blue Danube Robotics. So um, we are Blue, uh, Blue Tenue Robotics. We are a young company, five months old, and we build assistive robots for handicapped and elderly people to assist them in their daily lives. So to bring the robots into daily lives, they have to be affordable, and there has to be a real use case. And for us, that's assistance for the handicapped. So our goal is to um, develop a robot around 12 to 15,000 euros and then to rent it to these people for 500 euros a month. Because in uh, Austria, there is a funding scheme. Uh, you get public funding for 24-hour uh, assistance. So our robot, is, is, it's not about care. It's about assistance. So people can rent this robot and have, uh, have the robot pick up stuff, go to the fridge, use, uh, bring something to drink, or something, but do it semi-autonomously. So we're not building this full autonomous robot, because I think it will take another 5, 10, 15 years because it's fully, until it's fully autonomous. But if they can use it semi-autonomously, lying in their bed or sitting in their wheelchair, using a tablet, steering it around, and then just pointing and picking up stuff, so we use the user for doing the hard stuff, some of the vision problems, and using the robot to act as the manipulation device. That's our vision. So, and if you want to uh, see our first prototype, um, it's in the Innovation Wonderland. That's the area where we present our robot head. Yes, that's, that's very cool. You can see their robot uh, near the academy stage, near the, in between the academy stage and the speaker lounge. And you actually raised, and you can see QB downstairs in the main foyer, <laughs> uh, as well as at the side of the stage. Walter, you raised a very interesting point that I think is dear to everyone's heart here because this is a startup conference, right? So everyone here is, you've got a startup, don't you? And the first question you ask is, how do I get funded? It's the first question I always hear. So I think that's where a lot of things have changed in the last 10 years for robotics, not just the technology, but also the funding landscape. And I want to put that question to the panel. Have things changed? If so, what? And how do you go about getting your robotics startup funded? Well, uh, in, in the US, um, there have been a couple of events which have made venture capitalists much more excited about uh, robotics companies. My, own, my old company, iRobot, is now publicly traded on the, uh, on the, on the NASDAQ stock exchange. So that was a, an, a, an exit event for the venture capitalists who put money into iRobot. And then um, last year, another company in Boston, uh, uh, Kiva Systems, which is a company that um, is used in fulfillment centers where the robots bring the shelves to a human picker. So the human is good at picking things out of boxes, but running along to all the different boxes to fulfill an order takes a lot of time. 
Um, that company, Kiva, was bought by Amazon for $800 million. So those two events have made venture capitalists sort of sit up, in the United States at least, and say maybe robotics is, a, is something that we can invest in. And just about every venture capitalist I talk to says, yeah, we're, we're, we're doing robotics too. And then I say, and what companies have you invested in? Well, we haven't found the right one yet. So it's a double-edged sword. Um, although in my new company, Rethink Robotics, we have five different venture capitalists have invested in it. Um, uh, some, three from Boston, one from Seattle, and one from Silicon Valley. So I would say the Willa Garage experience is interesting because uh, it was funded completely by one fund uh, that, uh, and it was funded at a very high level. And so it was an interesting opportunity to be, to be free and open and uh, create open source things. Um, the spin-offs from Willow have a, a, a mixed stories. And, and in, in fact, I tried to get Willow itself funded uh, at the end uh, by venture capitalists um, and strategic investors. And I think actually would have been successful in strategic investors. Um, the difference between venture capitalists and strategics is that venture capitalists have a fund. There's somebody that they're investing money for, and they've promised to give that money back within a fixed period of time. Therefore, they're going to push you to move, to move quickly to a liquidity event. Um, strategic investors tend to be like large companies, and they have some long-term strategy that they're trying to uh, deploy that you as a startup may fit into. And so they're willing to invest in you, maybe ultimately acquire you, but at least open up options for themselves long term that they maybe couldn't do in house. Um, and I think that's interesting. There, there's this, uh, there has been this rumor over the last couple of years that uh, venture capitalists on the East Coast like to fund uh, robotics companies, but West Coast venture capitalists in the US uh, don't. And I think that's changing to some extent, but the, the West Coast venture capitalists tend to flock a little bit um, and look at. You know, when the internet is hot, they're all investing in internet. And it's very, very hard to get anything else invested in um, if there's something that's so hot that everybody's, that everybody's going for. Um, but right now, robotics is starting to look interesting. I think it's starting to look hot. And um, we had a robo business conference in Silicon Valley last week that was very well attended with a lot of startup companies um, and a lot of VCs there. And so uh, I think things are changing in that, in that respect. Um, yeah, so it's great to see that the hardware is cool again from an investment standpoint, but uh, let's not forget that it is software that drives hardware um, and, and always important. But to, uh, to kind of add what Andre had mentioned and also to, to say what Walter had talked about as well, um, I'll, I'll get to the investment point. I'd like to say that uh, I, I think Silicon Valley is more of a concept than it is a culture. And, and hearing what you guys are doing, it, it's kind of proving that you know, it's a, there's a risk-taking culture to the valley that's, that's spread, and it's definitely here in Vienna, you can tell, and it's great to see. But, you know, it's, uh, it's this that I think is sparking the innovation, and it's what sparks the, uh, the, the, the ability that you're willing to take this risk and not be afraid to fail or not let the failure kill you. Kill you. And I think it's the... Um, this that very much sparks the fact that uh, it sparks the people, the universities, and the money, and not the other way around. And, it, and it's just great to see here. But from an uh, investment standpoint, we've talked to quite a few VCs. Um, all of the, them have given us very constructive feedback. They think that we have great technology, but uh, from a hardware perspective, it, it, it takes a lot of fixed capital to be able to raise the money to get to where we need to be. So. Uh, we are owned by a, a group of angels that uh, are, are more in the strategic part of it, of a long-term plan, and, and leveraging uh, you know, the plethora of available resources that we do have available uh, in the Valley itself, and one being we're part of a collaborative manufacturer that helps us with the, uh, to leverage the, the cost of manufacturing and what it takes to build the robot. Uh, we also can outsource some of uh, the special projects that we need to work on by finding the expertise and handling our support. You know, we have 24 hours, seven day support uh, by working with a, a third party company. So I think the, the hesitance from the VC probably comes a lot from the fact that uh, we haven't been able, from a telepresence standpoint, to find that one use case 
uh, that will create a sustainable business model long term. And so we're all just pounding the pavement trying to find it and taking on all these different uh, use case challenges and pilot programs. And I think we're very close. And, and once that happens, then you know, the funding is going to drive the development of, of robotics. And actually, in the last week, there have been two more events that nudged the dial a little bit. And one was the launch of the first uh, exchange for, purely for the trading of robotics stocks, which suggests that there are sufficient robotics companies publicly offered for it to be worth someone's while to create a special exchange simply for robotics stocks. And the second was an even larger acquisition than the Kiva one, which was Mako Surgical being acquired by Stryker for $1.4 billion, I believe. By, by the way, I, I was a venture capitalist for a while, and I invested in that company. <laughs> you have a very good track record, I gather. <laughs> but I understand the funding landscape in Europe is quite different to the landscape in the US, and there are some remarkable initiatives that have been announced, and I don't know how well they're actually progressing, but perhaps you Walter, Michael, you can tell us a little bit about the landscape here. Yeah, right. so I don't think we have the Silicon Valley startup spirit here just yet, but it's gaining track. Um, well, Brutanio is the first startup I helped co-founding, so I can't tell about the situation 10 years ago. Uh, but my feeling is that uh, I keep seeing more and more startups, so it's, it's becoming more of a culture here too. Uh, the willingness to take risks is increasing, and there are some organizations that help, up, uh, that help startups in, in setting up shop. Um, so we, we are we're taking up an uh, incubation program with our business idea. Um, and that's a big, really big step for us. So we get the network. We are in a, in a free office space for one year, uh, being surrounded by other startups. So on the hallway, you meet people, and you'll start talking about this and that. Um, they have experts in um, getting us in touch with uh, venture capitalists, business angels. Um, um, this event is taking, taking place the second time, I think, now, the festival here. So again, this shows that there's a lot of more startups um, happening here. Um, about venture capital, I can't talk yet. We, we haven't taken up any venture capital yet. But again, we're being um, helped by by our incubation company in, in meeting the right people. Also, we meet people here, of course. I believe there's a European initiative to match funds. So if there is private investment into a robotics company, there is 50% 50, 50 matching funds, and indeed, many of the costs covered as well. And that's an 8 billion fund. I, I'd certainly love to see that in the States, but I know that's not going to happen. But don't you think that's going to propel growth as well as the technological inventions? I didn't get that. Sorry. Do you think the European Fund for Robotics is going to propel growth of robotic startups? Oh, d definitely, yes. Um, I don't know what, what are the rules to, I mean, how easy it will be to access that funding, but it's certainly making a, a big difference. But it doesn't come overnight. You've been working in the research lab for quite some time yes. to get to where you're at. And you actually touched on that point earlier. Uh, you've got a good team. What are some of the challenges for first off finding a good founding team and then second off keeping it and then growing it? Perhaps you can shed some light on it. Well, keeping is um, find the funding to keep them. Uh, and for finding what we want to explain. For us, it was rather easy because we came from the university, so we had there the students. We worked with the students on different projects, and then we know the people. And it's like, oh, he's good at this part, he's good at there, and then we invite them to the company. So that's like a pre-selection process for free. That's, that's great because we don't have the funding yet, so we can't try out people. So it's a perfect place to find new people. But as uh, Rodney mentioned. Yeah, once the company gets older, you need experienced people, not just people from the university. But yeah, you're five months old, so I can't talk about that yet. Starting. Whereas for the other companies here, you started originally with research and were able to utilize students. And in Willow's case, you utilized students um, significantly. But what, what comes next when you're a real company? 
when I started Willow, I had some recommendations. I should go hire this, you know, very well-known, uh, actually not so well-known, but a postdoc from the University of Pennsylvania. And, and uh, he came out, he interviewed, he was all excited. And then his advisor started telling him not to come. You're throwing your career away. Don't go there. And I had to travel to Philadelphia and, and basically tell them, no, no, it's OK. It's a real company and stuff like that. So it's sometimes hard to get people who aren't are sort of in a startup mindset to, to make that jump. I, I worked very hard to get somebody who had been at S SRI for 30 years to come to Willow Garage. Um, and then he was a member of the second startup, second spinoff from Willow Garage. He was one of the first people to jump out of Willow Garage into the spinoff world. And so he refers to Willow as a halfway house, you know, sort of between the long-term research and, uh, and then startups, uh, at least it was for him. So I think it's, it's almost always on a case-by-case -case basis how you get the people that you really need. And that's actually something I've seen in general, that if you're a good robotics researcher, you have no shortage of very secure positions being offered to you. And that makes leaping ship to a startup a risky proposition. And I think we're seeing a lot more people taking the leap. I suspect that it's easier to get startups started, and that might be why more people are taking the leap when there are such good positions behind them. And it kind of ties into something, Rodney, you've said it many times. Robotics is not so much the technology problem. It's more of a business problem now. Um, what do you think is? Yeah, well, um, I've started a, a bunch of companies, and, and iRobot ended up as a successful company. But we had 14 failed business models. One of our failed business models was to put uh, inspection robots in nuclear power plants. We worked with the Japanese government in the mid-1990s. Then they said, no, you don't really need robots in, in, in uh, nuclear power plants, until Fukushima happened. One week later, the Japanese government called up iRobot and said, please send robots. And so iRobot has robots in Fukushima doing uh, measurements and cleanup. And now, Nuclear power plant robots are being sold by iRobot because now there's a dedicated, a, a shown need. So the trick for all of us is to find a place where we're doing something useful that the customer wants to pay for. And I think that's maybe more important now than the technology. It's easy to be in a, in a university for many years and think you've got great technology, but you have to find something that someone really values in terms of what you can do for them. And so while getting PhDs to come and work for the company for, for research, you also need to worry about manufacturing. So how are you going to manufacture the robot if you're going to sell it? Because you've got to sell something, and you have to do that well. And then all the stuff that technologists don't like to think about, sales and marketing and all that stuff, is actually really important. And business models. That could come as a surprise to some robot companies. You do have to sell them. Yeah. Uh, do you have any more reflections on that? And indeed, if I can throw this in, has lean startup methodology had any impact? Or what is the role of customer development? And when do you fold that in to your iterate, rinse and repeat cycle? We're spending probably most of our time right now doing customer development, sort of the classic startup. Um, to, to answer this exact question, right? What value can we provide uh, for a cost less than that value, right? To make a business, and it's not the way you, uh, you think about academic robotics, um, and it's not the way that we thought about things at Willow Garage. We said, can we do this? Can we technically achieve this? Um, and the answer was at Willow Garage, sure, we can build a robot for two hundred eighty thousand dollars that can play pool and can get a beer from the fridge, but nobody will ever buy it. So the question is, at what price would somebody buy that robot, and how can we build the robot for less than that, that value that we're providing? Um, and you know, everybody talks about having robots help in elder care. Um, I think it's a great market. The thing that everybody has trouble answering is exactly what can we do feasibly for a price that makes sense for people who are aging? How can we keep people from moving to assisted living or to a skilled nursing center? And, those are, the, those are the real problems, the real questions that we have to figure out. It's extremely interesting when you go in listening as opposed to going in talking as a technologist 
And um, you know, when, when Henry Evans scratched his itch, the quadriplegic, it was eye-opening to us because nobody expected him to do that. We didn't know what he was doing, but, and he wasn't talking to us, obviously, because he's mute. But um, when he did that, it was, it was a shock. And so recently I asked him, what else do you want robots to do for you? We keep asking him that question. He said, you know, I'd really like to be driving a robot soccer player, uh, which is really interesting. Roboticists do this thing called RoboCup. We make robots play soccer by themselves, which I don't think is fun for the robots. And I think it's fun for the people building the robots. Um, but if you let people play, ro play soccer who can't play it otherwise, that's a really interesting opportunity. That's fantastic. And in fact, that should be the final question for the whole panel is, if I ask what's the killer app for robotics, that leads to a very long ethical debate that we don't have time for. So let's flip that and say, what's the most important problem that you think robotics can solve for the future? Why do you do it? Why robotics? Well, I, I, I think we just touched upon it. The uh, flipping of demographics in Europe, in North America, and Japan, and ultimately in, in China will mean that we will need more assistance for people like me who are getting older. And we see it already in terms of self-driving cars. The self-driving car technology will be something which enables older people like me to drive safely longer. So it's going to be robotic technology, not necessarily a big robot, but robotic technology helping people stay in their homes longer because they can uh, get the groceries from the car into their, into their home, etc. Those sorts of technologies are going to be important. And I think will 10 to 20 years from now be what the robot business is about. Yeah, I, I fully agree with Rodney. I, I think it's also, um, if we could get rid of all these mundane activities that we do on a day-to-day -day basis, so that way we can focus on more important things, uh, I, I believe that's really what robots is going to bring to the future. Yeah. So. Obviously, we see the, the market of disabled, handicapped, and elderly persons as well. That's a good entry point, because these are people with the highest need for robots now. And eventually, we all want to have robots in our homes, or the little helpers that are, help us clean up the children's room, or fold out towels and, and, uh, and shirts. That will be some time yet, but um, I think it's, uh, it's important to start now and find those market segments where the technology we have now, with its limitations, is still a useful business model for them. And for us, this is the handicapped persons, because they don't expect the robot butler to be fully autonomous, but they're willing to engage with the robot, use it as a tool, and eventually uh, give it feedback in its, uh, in its task. That's a wonderful answer. So we won't have the robot butler yet, but we will be able to take some small steps, some semi-autonomous steps, some task-based steps that are the steps towards having the full robot personal assistant that we've seen in science fiction. Well, I'd like to thank the panel. This has been a fantastic discussion. Thank you. Thank you.